There are many extreme objects in the universe that we live in, but today I'm going to look at a dead star that would literally rip you apart. Welcome to the strange and deadly world of magnetars. Neutron stars, but scarier. Let's find out more. Let's think briefly about neutron stars and how they're formed. For stars like our own sun, during the life while they shine, they're constantly smashing hydrogen atoms together to make helium. This process, called nuclear fusion, as well as making helium, also produces a little bit of energy. And since this is happening huge numbers of times per second, the sun actually generates massive amounts of energy that we feel and see every day. Now all of this hydrogen has a huge mass, and so therefore, huge gravity. And this gravity tries to crush the sun smaller and smaller. But counterbalancing that is the force of the energy production pushing outwards. And this celestial balancing act will continue in our sun for another few billion years. However, if a star has more than eight times the mass of our sun, then at the end of this stage of its life, something different happens. At the star's core, all the hydrogen is used up and is being turned into helium. Nuclear fusion then stops. This means that the pressure of the energy produced by fusion decreases and the star begins to shrink. As it shrinks, hydrogen from the outer layers of the star is forced towards the core and nuclear fusion can resume again in a shell surrounding the helium rich core. Also, as the core of the star gets smaller, the outer layers of the star expand. As it expands, the outer layers cool down and this stops the star from expanding any further. And we can often see these expanded stars in the galaxy as red giants and supergiants. As the helium rich core shrinks further, temperatures rise and if the star is big enough, the temperatures will get so high that it will be high enough to start fusing the helium at the core. The helium will then be fused into carbon and oxygen, and there'll be enough of this helium around to last many millions of years. And as this happens, the temperature of the core will increase further. Next, the fusion of carbon produces sodium and neon and magnesium. And this process of fusing heavier and heavier atoms in shells moving out from the core is called shell burning. Though this isn't really burning in the sense that we'd normally think of it. Eventually, fusion forms iron. And this can't be fused any further. Well, that's not strictly true. Fusion of lighter elements up to this point has always produced energy, and so has maintained the outward pressure, keeping the star in existence. Iron fusion, however, would require more energy than it produces. This now means that the star has used up all of its fuel, and very rapidly the core collapses. This means that the star now has used up all of its fuel, and the outward pressure of nuclear fusion no longer exists. As a result, the core of the star collapses, and it implodes at about a quarter of the speed of light. This collapse then rebounds and blows the star apart in a supernova explosion. The core, however, remains behind, but now, with no outward pressure, gravity dominates and crushes the core smaller and smaller. In the star's core, we find atomic nuclei consisting of neutrons, protons and electrons. However, with the pressure of gravity, the electrons are forced into the protons to form more and more neutrons, until eventually we're left with mainly neutrons, hence the name neutron star. The combining of protons and electrons releases huge numbers of neutrinos, which explode away from the newly forming neutron star the temperature of which is an astonishing 100 billion Kelvin, that's about 10,000 times hotter than the core of our sun. The star needs to get rid of all this heat energy in order to remain stable, and so this is achieved by the release of a second burst of neutrinos, which form as neutrino and antineutrino pairs. This second burst of neutrinos releases about 10 to the 46 joules, 
This is about as much energy as the sun would produce if it were to shine for a trillion years. Without going into too much detail, what we're left with is a neutron star. A super dense soup of neutrons. A neutron star is a mass of between 1.1 and 2.1 times that of our sun, but contained in a body just 20 kilometers or 12 miles in diameter. That's about the size of a city here on Earth. They are so dense, in fact, that a single teaspoon of neutron star matter would weigh about a billion tons. That's roughly as heavy as Mount Everest. There are different types of neutron star. Most of the ones that we've found are called pulsars. All stars spin, and therefore, so do neutron stars. However, due to something called the conservation of angular momentum, as a star collapses into a neutron star, it becomes much, much smaller, and this means that it starts to spin faster. This is the same kind of effect we see when an ice skater spins. As they bring their arms and legs closer to their body, they start to spin faster. Pulsars also emit radiation from their magnetic poles, and these are sometimes different to their centre of rotation. We then detect this radiation as pulses as the neutron star spins, a little bit like a lighthouse. Its light is constantly shining, but we only see it when it shines in our direction. And pulsars can spin very quickly, up to hundreds of times every second. The other type of neutron stars are called magnetars. They share some common features with pulsars, but also have some unique features. These are more rare than pulsars. We've discovered more than 3,000 pulsars in the Milky Way, but we've only found about 34 magnetars. This may be due to the fact that magnetars don't last very long. We think that maybe 1 in 10 neutron stars becomes a magnetar. Well then, let's have a look at these extreme bodies and a little about how they're similar and how they're different from pulsars. Well, as they're neutron stars, they form in the way that I've already described, just like any other neutron star. But as they collapse to form the magnetar, we think that the spinning of the matter inside the star, which I'll talk about more later, which includes some positively charged protons, acts a little like a dynamo, generating a strong magnetic field, just like the spinning of the Earth's core generates our magnetic field. However, due to the strange nature of the matter inside the magnetar, that dynamo effect amplifies the magnetic field more and more as it spins more and more. In a matter of just a few seconds, the magnetic field of that magnetar has become the strongest magnetic field in the known universe. It could just be though that magnetars form from stars that already have really powerful magnetic fields. At the moment, we just don't know. Let's pay a visit to a magnetar and see what it's like there. We don't want to get too close because these are pretty extreme places. They all appear to be quite far away as well, which is good. Here is one that's located about 9,000 light years away, so we'll pay this one a visit. If we were to look at magnetars from space, we'd notice a few strange things. Firstly, because of their huge mass and tiny size, magnetars have a huge gravitational pull. The light coming past the magnetar would be bent quite considerably as it passed. As we can see, this distorts the space around the star, a little bit like the way light is distorted around a black hole. Also, normally when we look at an object, we can only see the side that's pointing towards us. However, on a magnetar, because of the huge gravity, we can even see some of the other side of the star, meaning we can see more than half. This is because the light from the other side is being bent round to the side where we are facing. If we then look down at the surface of the magnetar, we'll see it has a crust, though temperatures down there at the surface might be as high as 5 million degrees. To our eyes, the surface looks white. Magnetars release most of their radiation as X-rays due to their high temperatures, but they will emit radiation as both blue and red light, making them look white. As we watch the surface of the star from a safe distance, we may see something strange happen. The magnetic field is so extreme that fluctuations in the field 
may cause star quakes. Yes, like an earthquake, but on the surface of the star. These are so violent that they can crack the crust of the star, leading to an enormous burst of gamma rays. These gamma ray bursts are some of the most powerful events in the universe. In fact, there was a neutron star called SGR 1806-20. It lies 42,000 light years away. In 2004, the Earth was hit by a gamma ray burst from this magnetar. This was so powerful that it was the brightest event to have taken place outside the solar system. SGR 1806-20 released in a tenth of a second, as much energy as the sun produces in 150,000 years. If the gamma ray burst had happened within 10 light years of Earth, it would have destroyed our ozone layer, leading to mass extinction events. Fortunately for us, the closest magnetar we know of is the one we're currently studying, 9,000 light years away. If we look at the crust, we may see mountains, but due to the extreme gravity, these will be just a couple of centimetres high, that's about an inch. However, the strangeness of the gravity here means that any object that was to fall off the mountain, by the time it hit the ground just a couple of centimetres below, it would already be travelling a considerable percentage of the speed of light. However, this is very hypothetical because as we'll see later, even getting close to the star will be a tricky proposition. If we look at the crust and beyond, and study the internal structure of these extreme objects, we're going to find a lot of strangeness indeed. The outer crust seems to be made from atomic nuclei and electrons, and just under that as we move towards the inner crust, these nuclei become larger and larger, with more and more neutrons. But as they get bigger, the nuclei can't hold on to all these neutrons, so they just spill out to form a sea of neutrons in which everything else is embedded. Just under this surface of the star, we find a sea of neutrons. These are fundamental particles that make up the nuclei of atoms, but down here the atomic nuclei are ripped apart under the immense gravity into a neutron sea. There are also some protons that seem to have managed to survive the neutronification of everything. Here, just under the crust, into what we might consider the mantle, there are some very weird forces at play. There's a strange battle going on between nuclear attraction and repulsion, and as a result, some of the neutrons form themselves into neutron balls, just a few hundred neutrons big. These are called nuclear knocky. And as we move further down towards the core of the star, these balls merge together to form long chains of nuclear spaghetti. Even further down, these chains merge together and now we have sheets of nuclear lasagna. And then even further down, even these sheets combine into a single uniform mass of neutrons. Below this, we may find layers of superconducting neutrons and superconducting protons in the outer core. Until eventually, as we move even further down, we come to the inner core, where strange matter may exist. And by strange, I mean matter that may be made from strange quarks, forms of matter not found in the universe at large. But we really don't know. Well, let's come back to the surface, because it's the immense magnetic fields that I want to talk about now, and why we're here. Scientists use a number of different ways of describing the strength of a magnetic field, and one of these is the Tesla. The magnetic field of the planet Earth is about 0 0.00005 Tesla, or 50 micro Tesla. If you have a fridge magnet on your fridge, that has a power of about 5 milli Tesla, or 0 0.005 Tesla. Pretty much the strongest magnets that are commercially available of rare earth magnets such as those that use neodymium. A coin sized magnet of this type can lift 8 kilos or about 17 pounds. These magnets have a strength of 1 Tesla. The strength of the magnetic field generated by a magnetar is between 100 megatesla and 100 gigatesla. That's this much. So, how powerful is that then? Well, if you manage to get within a thousand kilometers of the magnetar, about 600 miles, 
the magnetic field would be so strong that it would literally rip you apart, atom by atom. The atoms that make up your body are affected by magnetic fields, and this field would tear you apart. If that wasn't bad enough, the magnetic field is so strong that it would affect the shape of the atoms, stretching them so that they were a hundred times longer than they are wide. This also wouldn't be very good for you. Not only that, but at a distance of 100,000 miles, or about 150,000 kilometres, the magnetic field would wipe all the data off the magnetic strip of your credit card. Hang on, I think I might be focusing on the wrong thing here. So powerful is the magnetic field that it would actually affect the vacuum of space and cause something called birefringence. This would refract and split the light in weird ways. This means that looking at the magnetar would appear as though you were looking at it through cellophane, with weird optical effects and illusions taking place. These are truly strange and deadly places. Fortunately, our time and space machine is impervious to all damage, even that of the extreme magnetic fields, though it is looking a little more battered than it used to. So, I think it is time for us to take the journey back to the safety of our solar system. We will be going off on our travels around the universe again at some time in the future, but for now, and until next time, thank you for watching. <laughs>